So here I stand near one of the geothermal plants of Iceland, which is an endless resource of energy. And one of the big questions is whether to exploit this for electricity generation, not only for Iceland, but also to sell it to the mainland Europe. Is this the future that we're seeing here? That summit would be a success if we see a viable vision of what the future could look like. And it would be a success if that is the future we want. If that's, and that's a phrase that uh, the UN itself actually uses. Yeah? If it mobilizes people for that other perspective. And that's not a matter of legal treaties. That's a matter of inspiration and looking for what I would consider the building blocks of such a perspective. I would be inclined to say that uh, it's actually values that are the main engine, value change. So the, not the idea that we want to have the you know, definitive cost-benefit analysis that it makes sense, but there is also sort of a, a moral component in this whole story. And that is to come from uh, the citizens at large. When the world meets in Rio next year, they will have to, world leaders will have to start by recognizing that we have failed. We've not met our promises in the Rio Conventions and we've not met the, the, the commitments we've made in the Millennium Development Goals. And therefore, we will start next year with, with a negative, namely a deep concern that we're moving in the wrong direction. Now that kind of crisis could actually be the release point for new ideas and, and innovation. So I, I, I foresee surprise in Rio next year that in fact uh, the world cannot allow itself to meet again without having some interesting outputs. I think it will simply be too embarrassing for world leaders not to take a major headway. And science is now so, so robust and so strong in, in supporting policy for a major transition towards global sustainability that we could, for example, foresee uh, some major progress when it comes to integrating the climate agenda with biodiversity, poverty and development. We could see a breakthrough in terms of defining global sustainable development goals to complement the Millennium Development Goals, which would be tremendously important because so far the, the discourse on sustainable development has been too closely linked to only poverty, as if it was only poor countries in the world that have to address sustainability. Many scientists are here and they will undoubtedly talk about the planetary boundaries. But what we also see is a new theme coming up, namely that of how to govern this planet. There was a long period in which we thought that we knew how to do that. There needed to be a world government, a United Nations organization that organized global problems with global politics. But now you see slipping in some uncertainty whether that format still will work. How would you typify Rio plus 20? I would uh, feel that Rio plus 20 will have to carry us over into a, a new period when there are new relationships also in the world. And I think in particular of the increasing importance, of course, of countries like China, India, Brazil, etc. Uh, it's uh, obvious that it's a very different world from what it was in 1992. We do need uh, some international action as well as local because the local uh, uh, can make a big difference and in some places there are communities that are taking uh, very serious action that is reducing greenhouse gases from that community rather dramatically but uh, if we get an international treaty that has some real fight to it. Uh, it may enhance the likelihood of other people taking action at multiple scales. Is there uh, some, something that you would single out as being the most important policy measure that sh should be considered in Rio? Uh, I, I think we, we globally, uh, in terms of a good policy measure from Rio, we need to consider the international environment governance because the environment 
is a global common good and uh, it, it does not respect uh, socio-political boundaries. So we have to ensure that globally we are acting together to ensure that the environment continues to be healthy, we have sufficient uh, pool of biodiversity, we have sufficient pool of environmental resources, water, quality air, and so on. So we need a strong international cooperation policy in the field of environment. The highlight for me actually today, and if you see behind me, this is all my colleagues walking around uh, from session to session and gathering and exchanging thoughts. It was actually the uh, talk by uh, Tony Giddens, who I will speak to later, who uh, very persuasively argued for what he called a uh, realist utopianism, the idea that you now have to look yourself into the eye as a world community and try and do something very different. Well, it's, it's a world, to me, in which we have radically increased interdependence with one another. Climate change is, as it were, a negative expression of global interdependence. But where our mechanisms of governing world society are so primitive compared to that level of interdependence, and so we're really struggling to produce any kind of coordinated response on a world level. And my hope is that the division between the industrial states and the uh, developing uh, world will break down and some of the larger emerging economies, especially China, will take a significant leadership role, along with uh, some of the industrial countries, especially the European Union. And then there's a fantastic, vibrant civil society around the world, which involves all sorts of innovations going on at many different levels from very tiny communities through to cities through to regions and I think a lot of our hope rests on the energy and the inventiveness of that civil society. So that's the talk that I think is, is powerful, the idea that we have a systemic problem, a problem that our system is just not functioning well. Now and that seems to be a talk a way of looking at the problematic that's also important for Rio, that we should change the practices that express what is normal. So perhaps green accountancy rules, a green business sheet, thinking about fair practice. Now sometimes it will be governments that uh, have to come up with these ideas, but it can also be that it's consumers, citizens, that just call for it and governments follow these citizens. We will call for an absolute commitment to inclusive green growth as the only way forward. We will argue for GDP plus, by which I mean the measurement of our natural and social capital to complement tradition. If you wanted to have a round of applause in the uh, 3,000 seat theatre, it were scientists saying things like the world must or this is the limit, or this is the boundary. And as a uh, scientist, actually, you should be really uncomfortable with that role because it's for us to give the best knowledge, but it's obviously for politics to decide what must be done. I thought there was a bit too much talk about the world as if the world has a cockpit. So if we talk about planetary boundaries that we shouldn't go beyond, there was always an allusion to some mysterious center of politics that would then uh, have to act differently. But our, our world in the 21st century is not like that. You might love the UN, but it's very clear from recent environmental history that the UN is not able to produce these sort of results on its own. And it is much more that you think how to coordinate between different governments and society to reach goals rather than that there is some mysterious center that speaks out what has to be done. And in broad terms, uh, our prescription, which we call green growth, is not trying to deny the fact that the extra two billion people and many, many billions more are going to want to improve their living standards and the security of their lives, rather than deny that, to say that the way we go about it is going to have to use resources much, much more efficiently. Now, the best way of doing that in many cases is to treat those resources as, they, as though they were really valuable, 
they really were scarce and they should have a price put on them. If you want to think about how you head off the worst uh, that could uh, come our way, then you have to start thinking now. Uh, and that means uh, thinking seriously about the efficiency with which we use resources. Now, there's a huge amount of policy experience in little bits and pieces on how to do that. We need to generalise it. Solutions don't ever come from just one place. I'm quite clear that they're never going to come top down. Uh, there's no way that a big international conference will change the game. Big international conferences are important for raising consciousness, but at the end of the day, in the sort of world we live in, most key decisions get taken at national level. So it's going to be a question of governments engaging with their populations, engaging with business, explaining the long-term issues that we're trying to deal with, and thinking of a transition path. One thing that doesn't work is just imposing a solution from the top and then wondering why everyone uh, protests, sometimes in, in the streets and, 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 and pretty nastily. Uh, it's a question of explaining the issues and building a consensus for change which people feel they can adapt to. The more you can link those changes to real benefits, even if they're not today, but reasonably proximate benefits, the better. There's a, a deep suspicion, actually, uh, amongst the developing world that the new idea of a green economy is just another way of the developed world to exclude them from markets. That is about new trade barriers. Now, I wouldn't dare to say whether they're right or wrong. I think it's an, an, uh, an open question. It very much depends on how you do it. The truly interesting point is if the developing world is going to kickstart its development by avoiding the mistakes we made and making a start in that green economy. This is Rampura Solar uh, based decentralized power plant. This is 8.7 kilowatt, uh, which we have uh, introduced in first time in this and the uniqueness of this project is totally community-owned project and more than anything else uh, beyond a start of art technology this is basically a community managed things more than anything else we have put all our efforts to bring people together who will going to manage it and last two and a half years people are managing this thing by their own and i i believe uh, this experience uh, helped me to believe the simple fact that along with technology we need to put major input uh, to build capacity of the uh, local community who will uh, become the main instrument to uh, run it. We have, for example, a, a, a stock exchange for entrepreneurs who want to be involved in sustainable development and investment. And so we're getting more and more wealthy people investing, not to for a return and dividends, but return for them is a social return. And that really echoes what Mohammed Yunus talks about in terms of social businesses. And we need a global social stock exchange mm -hmm. where we can have instead of the old style aid we should have investments social investments by people whether you live in the netherlands wanting to invest in south africa you need to know which social business actually has is going to give you a higher social return if there would be two things that you had to mention that would be crucial for a strategy of development what would those two things be um for me, the two things would be uh, how do we uh, look at governance global as well as down to the uh, local level because I think what we are looking at is a green economy and in the national context not looking at green governance and how do we shift the focus from uh, just value adding through trade and commerce to value adding through a system of governance where you conserve your, uh, your natural resources. And why is it that your preference is for that local system? Because what we've seen is that centralized systems uh, tend to favor uh, the vested interests and the more powerful. And at the local level, the power is more diffused. And collective interest does become more important. 
South Korea wanted to take the leadership role in transforming developing countries uh, into green economies. And uh, uh, as one of the, uh, the programs that uh, South Korean Presidential Init Initiative identified, um, they have formed a group of experts and let them visit small to medium-sized companies in South, uh, Southeast Asian uh, countries and see what are the uh, eco-innovation potential and grow green growth potential there and report them back to South Korean government. We are reporting back to uh, European and South Korean officials about the potential of South, uh, Southeast Asian countries to improve on their resources efficiency and energy efficiency and transform them to a more greener economy. Okay, so South Korea takes a, a regional approach that involves many countries in the, in the Asian, Southeast Asian region. That's right. So the approach by South Korea is that um, the green economy cannot be achieved by one country. It, it needs to deal with multiple countries throughout the supply chain, throughout the global value chain. And um, greener economy or the efficient, efficient pr production process of one country does not mean anything if they are sourcing their raw materials from elsewhere. We need to deal with problems that have characteristics which are fundamentally different from what we've been used to in the past. We need to have some kind of a paradigm shift. Now, the critical question for us in terms of these global environmental problems is can we make that kind of shift without the kind of destructive and disruptive experiences that preceded the economic insecurity? I mean, do we, can, can we avoid a Great Depression? Can we avoid a world war or the counterpart of that in the environmental sphere in order to make this shift? When we're talking about the future of humanity on this one planet, we have to think simultaneously about human rights and getting people out of poverty at the same time as living within the planet's limits. It's an incredibly exciting and positive vision. We should all want to live in a safe and just space for humanity. We should all want economic development to be inclusive and sustainable. It's an incredibly exciting vision for scientists to work towards, for economists to frame their work around, and for civil society to mobilize around. We need to get governments on side to pursue that vision in the common interest. Now we have so much scientific evidence to suggest that we have entered the global scale of environmental challenges. We are uh, potentially in a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, where humanity constitutes a geological force at the global scale. And, and this requires from Rio 2012 to start addressing the challenge of meeting sustainable targets at the global level. So really collaborating among all countries to meet sustainability targets. Scientists have been pointing out that it's 5 to 12 for the last 40 years. What I think science should now do is build upon that understanding of these limits and show the potentials. Show where we can actually create a world that is nourished and is also uh, economically viable. In the economy, we have long waves of change, and they're often related at changes in means of production, whether it's the steam engine or it's the emergence of uh, uh, ICT technologies, for instance. And every time, actually, th this system, this, uh, our capitalist economic system, needs these phases of what Schumpeter has called creative destruction. It needs to break with the way we organize it in order to create new potential for growth. Now, this is an interesting thought. Could it be that precisely the problems of capitalism and of our economy, our way of living, namely that we ruin our natural environment, that that would give a new leash on life in the form of a green capitalism? Now, that, that thinking is very much also now being discussed. I would say it's too early to tell in academic terms whether that can work. But it would give you a perspective where states know what to do, namely provide certainty and targets, where business knows what to do, namely provide the technologies and earn a lot. Financiers suddenly have business opportunities because you know there's trillions hanging in the bank without any return at the moment. And of course, it would, most important of all, be orienting investment to our real needs.